Welcome to tonight's program. Um, first wanted to, well, we have some possible guests. I see from the list here, we have um, Sheila Mesmer signed in. Sheila, are you out there? Oh, yes, that's is. me. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Sheila. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you don't mind, you know, we'll put you on the spot and ask you know, how you found us, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you kind of like in terms of photography and so forth. Um, well, I am just uh, a beginner. My um, parents connected me with a photographer um, and I am just starting um, the Great Courses DVD on photography that she gave me. And um, she recommended looking into camera clubs so I just Google camera clubs and this one came up and um, I'm a retired teacher. So I have some more time now to focus on some different things. So I just thought I'd start checking it out tonight. Awesome. <clears throat> well, thanks for reaching out to us. And again, as we talked about last time, sounds like Carl's doing well with his uh, search engine optimization because we seem to pop up high on the list. And, um, we hope you enjoyed tonight's program. And then as Cliff will talk about uh, here shortly, you know, he'll talk about our next competition. What we typically do is have one program meeting and a competition. And then when we have uh, fifth Wednesdays in a month, which do we have one this month? Or is it March? It's in March. It's in March. Yes, yeah, so we'll do a, uh, a, like a critique session. Um, you know, um, it's a, a mentoring modified. session, sir. Yes, we revised the name of it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carl, do you want to explain the mentoring session? You, know, you kind of came up with that concept. Um, I don't know that I necessarily came up with the concept. It's you know, it's <laughs> kind of a thing that we've been doing for a number of years. But um, obviously, when we were meeting in person, we would have people bring in images either on a tablet, laptop, or print. Okay. And just break up into small groups and you know talk about them and, and give some suggestions and, and hints you know some of the people who've been in the club for a long time and have experience with competitions and stuff would you know comment oh if you crop this a little if you dodge this a little if you change the color here a little bit ways to improve the images so obviously that's going to be a little bit of a challenge with zoom but um what we're planning on is doing the same thing is that members will submit their images uh, through the normal form on the website, just like you would for a regular competition. Just tag them as critique and I'll gather them together and we'll gather as a group here and, and discuss the images. I'll show them up on the screen. I'll share my screen in Lightroom. And uh, while people are talking about it, I'm hoping to do some quick edits uh, so that you can see uh, you know, what happens when you crop it here, when you change the color, when you dodge this when you add a graduated filter, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So hopefully through that, people can learn from others about you know, what things might help to improve their images. Um, and you'll be able to see in real time you know, exactly what those changes will mean. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Carl. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, again, thanks, Sheila, for joining us. Thank you. Um, I had another possible, I didn't, I haven't seen Grace, Ryan, are you on? I didn't notice if she logged on. No. Um, Danny Teitelbaum, obviously we've seen you. So I'll let you introduce yourself to the group. And Thanks, I'm here. Uh, I'm a uh, retired physician and a university professor. I've been a photographer, I'm 86. So I've been a photographer since I was nine years old. My dad uh, was a lawyer who was never without a camera. And in, when he was in his late 70s, he had a Minox in his vest pocket. I still have the Minox. And uh, I've been photographing. I'm primarily a street photographer. I did all my own processing of everything, black and white color, everything but, uh, but uh, slide film uh, until uh, I got to be 80. And then we decided we'd better have a bedroom on the ground floor. And obviously, I either slept in the sink or the dark room had to go. So the dark room went and <clears throat> I started uh, doing more digital work. I'm not fond of digital printing. So about uh, 10 years ago, 
I began to do printmaking and most of the work I do now is in photogravure. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, we appreciate you joining us. Oh, I should have said, I found you on the, on the net too. I was looking for a, a club in Denver uh, and uh, you guys looked online terrific. So who's ever doing your uh, uh, online stuff, bravo, you, you hooked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, that's uh, Carl who was just talking about the uh, mentoring program. Great, thanks Carl, I appreciate it. I needed company. Thank you, that's awesome. And one more possible, I haven't noticed if uh, Jasmine Wang signed on, is Jasmine here? All right. Well, it looks like we just have the two visitors tonight. And again, we hope you will uh, you know, check out our next program meeting or our competition meeting. And I'll let Cliff uh, talk about that uh, before we introduce our speaker. Yeah, so the, the subject for February is artificial light. Um, so that's where primary light source for any image must be artificial. That is, it cannot be the sun, moon, or stars. Um, examples include the use of flash or strobe, LED lights, street lights, building lights, or light painted uh, night photographs. For example, a photo of star trails would not qualify, but star trails with a light painted foreground element would. And as we've been doing with all the um, uh, pandemic season competitions, uh, we have the, the theme for the month, but then um, open is also valid for any, any of the competitions too, for we want to make sure that people don't feel compelled to, to go out when they, they may not be feel safe, you know, going out and about. So that's it. All right. Thank you very much, Cliff. So um, tonight we have uh, Thomas Cooper, um, you know, and he's going to talk about, um, just drew a blank on the name of the fire. Troublesome, East Troublesome. Thank you, Tom. East Troublesome Fire. Um, you know, I saw a news clip, a uh, news story last year about how he had gone into the fire area and you know, was doing a photojournalistic uh, cover on it. And it intrigued me right away. So I reached out to Tom and, you know, asked him if he would be open to presenting um, to our club, you know, kind of his his story uh, from a photojournalistic perspective on you know, capturing the images, what he saw, interacting with firefighter, firefighters, um, homeowners, and so forth. Um, you know, if you haven't looked at Tom's website, I would uh, welcome you, uh, recommend you do. It's called Lightbox Images. Um, you know, he's been in some very uh, prestigious publications, you know, New, New York Times, Sports Illustrated, National Geographic, Time Magazine. Um, one of the, the galleries that really caught my eye is his music gallery. Uh, the photo of Rob Zombie was just amazing. Um, if you don't know who Rob Zombie is, he's a, a hard rock um, musician, but you, know, you have some beautiful photos on there from uh, concerts, looks like Red Rocks and I'm sure other venues around the Denver area. Uh, but with that, I wanted to let Tom introduce himself and then um, Tom, you should be able to hopefully down at the bottom, be able to share your screen. If not, I will set you up to be able to share your screen. Okay, yeah, I see a little button there and I clicked on it um, where it shows that I can share it. Um, yeah, yeah, so. Um, I guess I'll just start off. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. And oh, as a reminder, um, please do yes. mute yourselves while Tom is talking, and then uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Sorry, Tom. Okay. No worries. No worries. I'm kind of new to Zoom. I've, I've used it a couple of times, so forgive me. Um, a lot of electronics, learning everything. So, But um, my name's Thomas Cooper. I'm a photojournalist by profession. I've been doing this similar to what Danny was talking about. Uh, when I got into photography, my dad was uh, did it as a hobby and I got into it when I was about eight years old and I uh, got bit by the bug and been doing it for all up till today. Um, I eat, sleep, shoot um, nonstop. 
Um, so basically, um, I got into it in more of a, um, I like taking pictures of nature and wildlife and things like that, but I, I like the uh, excitement and the, um, the uh, energy adrenaline rush from news photography and uh, being out capturing everything. I never really specialized in one thing just because um, I started off working for weekly newspapers. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Sentinel Transcript newspapers, I worked for them for about, uh, for at least about 15 years, maybe 10 or 15 years. And then um, if any of you guys are from Denver, I worked at the Rocky Mountain News until basically went under um, back in the day. So um, I did a lot of uh, uh, specialty stuff for them. But um, I, I got into this uh, kind of like a lot of you guys like, you know, I love taking pictures. I love making images. Um, but uh, one of my passions was is, is following news. And when I was younger, I used to keep the scanner on 24 seven. And if there was an accident or a fire or a shooting or something like that, I would be up in the middle of the night chasing chasing that news story and, and uh, selling it to the newspapers late at night for the, the page one in the morning. So that was that was my adrenaline rush and, and I really enjoyed it. it. You know, it really put me into a lot of situations from, you know, unfortunately seeing the, the harder part of life and people dying on highways and fires and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, it, it, it you kind of had to look at things in a, um, a perspective of you're there to get a story and you have to kind of put a lot of your emotions and stuff back inside and and do what you got to do to get that picture to tell the story and so that's what i've been doing for most of my life and you know being in the photojournalism industry you get covered you get called to cover anything from fires to concerts to feature photos to uh, news um, press conferences. Um, I know at one point I was covering all of the Kobe Bryant trials up in uh, um, Vail and up in um, Eagle, Colorado for some time, um, which required staying out, covering um, him every time he showed up, turning images around, um, that kind of stuff. Um, um, and I'm, I'm kind of with Danny. I, I, I grew up in the, in the industry where um, we would, back in the olden days in the Rocky Mountain News, we would, you know, soup film. We'd come back from a game, a Bronco game or whatever. We'd process all our film, um, T-Max, stuff like that. Turn it around, clip our negatives, print it, put our captions on the back and send it out to the, the, the daily um, thing where they would take it and they would end, it, end up in the newspaper. So I have a lot, I grew up on film and processing and darkroom work, which kind of, Nowadays that people are getting into photography, some of that's been lost on them and they think everything's digital. And I've taught a couple of classes where, you know, I try to tell people, you know, this is, this is the, you know, the past of photography and it's good to know that. But um, getting on to um, um, the stuff for the fire, um, I've been covering fires here in Colorado since, if, if any of you remember the um, High Meadows fire and the Buffalo Creek fires back in 2000. Um, that's when our first fires started blowing up around here, and it, it um, before that there wasn't there wasn't a lot of big major fires in Colorado. Um, there were little you know fires here and there, but uh, Buffalo Creek was one of the biggest fires in Colorado back then, and then so on and so forth. The High Meadows fire came along, and then the Heyman fire came along with Terry Barton, and and fires have become kind of a a, a thing out here that you know, it's become more prevalent in the news and people are, are seeing more and more news coverage on it and they're, they're getting a lot more exposure. Um, so um, I, I took it upon myself um, after covering the first couple fires back in 2000 to go out and get trained because I knew from the first fire that I covered that, you know, I needed to be properly prepared and qualified and, and know what I'm doing. Um, I'm one of these photographers where if I go into something, whether it's I'm photographing a, a wildlife species or something like that, I like to know exactly what I'm shooting and know all about this kind of stuff before I go out into the field and try to, to do it just because it gives me the knowledge and, and I'm, I'm doing it in a safe way. And um, I'm taking the, the right strides to, 
to make sure I'm safe and I'm not putting myself in harm where I'm going to end up being that person that has to be rescued and end up on the news. So um, I, I took it upon myself to go through all the fire training. I went through um, the wildland, complete wildland course and got certified in my S-130, S-190, uh, basic wildland, advanced wildland, and even had to, uh, to take uh, the testing, uh, pass all the testing and um, do the pack test, which is something that all wildland firefighters have to do. It's a three mile walk in with a 45 pound pack in 45 minutes. And so it's pretty strenuous, but you have to do that in order to get the certification to, to be on the front lines and get embedded with some of the fire crews and stuff like that. And it was such a passion to me that I wanted to have this experience and this, this training. So I wasn't the person on the, on the, in, on the back burner, just kind of no pun intended, but being able able to get in there and shoot and get that frontline fire images that that um, I've shot over the many, many years. And um, it's definitely worked. It's it, it's shown it, you know, being able to do this and get that training has gotten me access to where these fires where I can get these images. Um, this year, this last year, 2020 has been if anybody would have told me I'd be covering, you know, pandemics, fires and riots, I would have said, yeah, you're you're maybe the fires, but I didn't realize I'd be covering all this stuff in one year. Um, I literally went from covering riots downtown with full ballistic gear on and gas masks and getting all kinds of stuff I've been shot at. Um, I've been tear gassed. I've been pretty much <laughs> gone through everything that's possible in photography. So I try to keep all this gear with me. But um, as with the fires, um, you know, I ended up um, bouncing from fire to fire. I was actually at the, uh, um, um, I believe it was the fire above Boulder. And let me see here. I have a, oops, hold on, where'd he go? So I was on the uh, Calwood fire and shooting it for some time and then um, went up to the Cameron Peak fire and then, got sent over to the um, the East Troublesome fire. And uh, it just seemed like I was going from fire to fire to fire because just they kept popping up left and right. But um, out of all the fires I've covered over for about 20 years now, um, I, I have to honestly say seeing some of the damage and some of the stuff that I saw from the East Troublesome fire, I've never seen anything like this in, in all my years of covering fires. And I've seen some pretty, pretty drastic things happen, things melting, things like that. But um, um, going into this fire was, it, it was like a fire I've never seen before. It was just so unpredicted. Um, uh, I've had, I've talked with some researchers and I've saw that this fire moved um, 17 miles in, um, oh, I think it was like 19 minutes or something like that. It was, it was insanely burning hot. It, it was just like, a, flash paper almost. But um, I got up to the fire um, uh, the night it was happening. And, and one of the things that I've been taught is that when these fires first start, you get in there and you, you, you have your gear and um, you get in there early when the fire is still going on. And that's when you get your images. And um, I'll share my screen and show you guys some of the work that I did from this. Let's see how I do this here. Okay, so um, let's see, let me close this and I'll open this. I have multiple screens here. So um, can you guys all see that? Can no, you guys, we can't. You can't see the pictures? Okay. No, I know. Yeah, there we there go. We go. Okay. So this is some of the stuff. Oh, okay. There I am over there now. So, okay. So this is some of the stuff that you, I saw first coming in. This was actually the, uh, um, let me get back in here. There we go. Can you still see it now? Yes. Okay. So this is some of the images that um, I've shot. Um, this was the Cal Wood fire, and I'll just I'll jump over to the one that we're talking about right now. But um, 
you know, getting in there early and shooting from different angles and having the right gear and stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty humbling to see some of this stuff. It's, it's mother nature, you know, doing what it does and, and just trying to be in the right place at the right time and keep yourself safe is, is the, the big part of it. Um, you know, getting in and, and it's, it, it's sad to see this stuff happen watching these homes burn and stuff. But, and a lot of people think that, you know, what I'm doing, you know, documenting this, but I've, I've discovered in the past that, you know, it's, it's really interesting. This shot was done above Boulder and this is the, the Calwood fire. And I was up on a hillside with a near where a hotshot crew was and some crews that were kind of watching the fire. And, um, you know, it was moving so fast that, you know, we, excuse me, Thomas. We're, um, I know you got multiple monitors there, but all we're seeing is the thumbnails. We're not seeing exactly oh. what picture you're talking about. Okay. There is that better. There you go. Yeah. If you can pop okay. it full screen there. That's it. I see. Cause I have two monitors. So when I move it up to this one, like you guys can see it. So that's, um, that's one of the Calwood fires, but you know, people see these images, you know, whether they get on the news or whether they're through social media, people see these images. And I actually had a lot of people, you know, reach out to me. Um, it was amazing. During the East Troublesome Fire, I had multiple people actually getting a hold of my number through different news outlets and asking me if their fire or if their houses were, their house was still um, intact. And some of the places I was at with some of the crews, they were, um, you know, I was trying to get back with them and tell them and find out what road they were on and give them information about what I saw burn and what didn't. Um, but uh, just covering the different angles and, and seeing this and people, I had a gentleman say that was my house in the foreground. And um, I was extremely scared when I saw this photo show up. But now that I see that the fire was moving uphill and they were able to salvage my house, you know, really really brought it to fruition that, you know, everything was okay. But I'm just going to funnel through these because I want to get over to the East Troublesome fire shots. You know, I, I'm one of these people where I don't go in and just shoot a couple pictures. I'm, I'm in this fire for, you know, days, sometimes weeks on end covering this stuff because the fire just doesn't stop when, you know, they get it out. There's, there's a lot to this afterwards, you know, covering the beauty of it and, and getting these magical shots at night is, um, you know, and getting in the right position when the, when the air ops come in to, to do their stuff, um, that kind of stuff. It's, it's, um, it's quite the challenge, um, you know, carrying all your fire gear. I'm required to, you know, have all my Nomax stuff on. Um, I'm required to have a fire, a current fire shelter, a uh, fire helmet. And then on top of that, I got all my camera gear. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, you're carrying around a lot of stuff. Um, you know, you got to have your safety gear plus all your camera gear because you never know where you might end up. And I'm usually running around with, you know, five or well, three cameras and five or six different lenses because, you know, there's no getting back to your car. Or, you know, you're in, usually embedded with a fire crew that can, you know, that are that's up on the side of a mountain or something like that. And, and you want to have all the different stuff you have so you can get those shots. But um, I'll kind of go through, these are kind of out of order, unfortunately. Um, but, um, you know, this is, this is a shot of one of the, um, he had lost his parents in the, the Troublesome Fire. If you guys are all familiar with that fire, um, the Heidelmans, they were uh, the couple that was killed and that's their son. Um, I went back um, after the fire was was not completely out but it was you know under it was kind of getting under control and it had burned into the Rocky Mountain National Forest but this was a I can't remember when this when this was shot um and that's not the right date up there it was not 12 to 7 11 but um we're going back here and we're recovering he had recovered a anvil from um the fire uh wreckage from a barn that was nearby and that was the the anvil that was given to him by his dad, who was an ex Denver firefighter. So a lot of this stuff I, I learned because I'm, I'm talking to the people and I'm learning about their stories, which eventually makes the photo. Um, I would have never got this photo unless I, I knew people and I talked to people and I gained access back in here um, with the Grand County Fire Department um, going back in and being able to get shots like this. 
Um, these are just some of the home. shots from the the fire. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. It looked like somebody had dropped a nuclear bomb up there. Um, just trees down. Um, we've known from the uh, the weather service that they had 120 mile an hour winds. Um, on top of that, they had a fire front with flame lengths at least uh, 15 to 20 feet out in front of them. And so if you can imagine um, the heat coming off of that, it, I mean, you can see the trees in the background that are just completely bowed in, a, in an arc. Um, you know, I take safety very seriously on a lot of this stuff. I, I don't go in this just to get the shot. I, you know, a lot of times I've, I've been trained in my fire training to have an escape route, to know where I'm at, to know where the fire's at, to keep up with the radio calls. So, you know, when something's um, going on and, and when you need to put the cameras down and, and exit. And um, it, it's hard to do sometimes because you're getting these shots that are just incredible and, and you and you want to keep shooting. And, um, you know, like Sean said, you know, he saw me on a news article and I told the, uh, the anchor person that was doing the story, it's just, you just shoot, shoot, and shoot and, and try to keep yourself as safe as you can. Um, this is some of the after stuff, but um, this is one of the shots after the fire across the road in Grand Lake. Um, and it was burning, you know, you're walking around, you've got trees coming down. Um, you, you, you know, you can see them coming down and a lot of the pictures, they're falling on the ground. There is so many dangerous hazards in a situation like this. And even having all the Nomax gear and boots and helmet and fire shelter and all this stuff on, sometimes it's, it's still a, a very, that's why they keep a lot of people out. But, um, you know, having the training I did, I was able to get in and get embedded with the fire department and be able to shoot this stuff, um, covering some of the stuff afterwards um, and uh, basically smelling like smoke for the next two weeks. No matter what you do, I still have cameras now that still reek with forest fire smoke because, you know, they were drugged through everything and anything. Um, so going back and covering some of the stuff they found in the ashes um, looking through and trying to tell the story and it's complete. You know, a lot of times it's, you know, you get in there, a lot of photographers would get in there and shoot and get the fire shots and that'd be done. But um, I'm one of these people where photographers that like, I like to show every aspect of what happened in a fire. Um, I went back up three weeks later um, um, in this fire and, and walked around for almost two days shooting pictures of some of the devastation that happened. This was back in Rocky Mountain National Park and you can see where the fire went up over the ridge and found elk that were just still smoldering in some places. Um, Tom, point of clarification, is all your metadata uh, accurate uh, with the exception of the date? The, the uh, I know it wasn't uh, December of 2011. No. Is, no, is no. I don't know why that's on there like that because this was actually shot with a Nikon. I shoot all with Nikon D810s now. So I don't know why it's telling me that I'm shooting this with a Nikon D300. So these were all shot um, with a Nikon D810. Um, I have three of those camera bodies and um, I have lenses ranging from, um, one of my cameras has uh, a 14 to 28 millimeter lens. It's a F stop of 2.8. I have a medium body. Uh, my central body has uh, a um, 28 to 70 zoom on it. Um, so that gets me within the, the range of normal. And if there is a normal. And then I have um, a third body, which I have a 70 to 200 2.8. All those lenses are all F 2.8. That's the widest opening. So I have everything covered basically from a 14 millimeter to a 200 millimeter. Those are the three lenses, my, my main three lenses that I shoot with. And then I have in my pack that I carry, I also have a, um, a, uh, a 200 to 500 in case I get a, you know, a shot of uh, an elk or something like that um, with the forest behind them. And that's something I just carry with me all the time, just because you never know. But yes, this metadata is wrong. I, I'm using a program called Photo Mechanic 6. And just earlier today, I updated my uh, software. And I don't know, um, 
why it's showing that, but um, these, I can go back to the originals. These pictures were shot um, October 23rd, 24th, right after the fire up in Rocky Mountain National Park. So I'm gonna just keep going through these. Um, so this is some of the shots uh, from the fire coming over. Um, some of the stuff I've covered going back in with um, people that have lost their houses in that. And that's another thing coming to photojournalism is to get to get to know some of the people in the community. And um, it's amazing how generous people are and they want to tell their story. Uh, I ended up staying the night at one of their other properties up there and went back in with a couple that had lost their bed and breakfast that they had built. And we, you know, I went back in and covered all these different things um, with them going through their, their, uh, their belongings and, and the emotions and stuff that come with it. Um, here's some of the shots during the heat of the fire when it was coming through, just basically an inferno. Um, and at some point I'd like to show a video, but um, this, the, the heat, radiant heat coming off of this fire was uh, nothing to be reckoned with. It was to the point where I had to turn my back and I, I could only shoot for a few minutes, even with a full mask on and, and no max gear and goggles and a helmet. Um, you get one or two shots off and you'd have to turn around because the radiant heat coming off this fire was so intense, it, it hurt. It literally hurt your face to, to, to stare into this. And um, so you get a couple of shots and then you turn around and wait a minute and then get a few more. Um, Here's some of the stuff that they recovered from one of the houses, some old guns that had burnt. Um, I apologize for this not being in order. I, this, this program kind of mixed it all up for some reason. But um, there's some of the stuff from one of the firefighters in the foreground. Um, you get some shots like this. The wind is so erratic that um, this is a small fire tornado that kind of whipped up. And uh, right by the lake, this fire had come right down to the lake, down to Grand Lake. And basically a lot of the firefighters were kind of letting it burn itself out because they knew that the lake would be a nice buffer and it wouldn't go any further than that. Um, and the way it was working that night, um, the fire had come down and moved its way to the, the south. So they were kind of letting it burn out there. Um, so going back and getting shots like this with the, the burn uh, in the background and the snow after a fresh snow, you know, I went back up several times and even weeks later after this fire, back in, even into December, there were still places where you would walk and you'd still, still see steam coming out of the ground or smoke coming out of the ground. Um, so I'm just going to go through these because I want you guys to be able to see a lot of them. Some of the wildlife coming back into the burn areas, um, just different areas. Here's Grand Lake showing this fresh snowfall. The lake. This was this picture was almost um, shot at the same location as this picture right here, but this was a couple weeks out. Um, trying to use my best um, eye to, to capture the beauty of the fire and to show Mother Nature what it does. Um, even doing some aerial drone work too to to try to get up above the fire and and show the the vastness of what it did and, and the mass where it burned. Um, using creative um, shadows and angles um, with the drone to shoot some stuff like this. I really like this shot because of the lines and, um, and showing the trees and stuff. It's just real compelling to me. Um, you know, after the, this was the first snowfall after the, the fire had gone through. Um, let's see, just showing some of the details of the fire. Some of the, uh, we're working on doing, um, a documentary on this with a couple other guys that are doing a video on it. And I wanted to fly the drone over and show us what it's doing, what it's gonna do eventually to the water up in, in Grand Lake and, and how it's gonna affect the water into the, the rivers and um, Rocky Mountain National Park. So we're trying to cover it from all different kinds of angles. Um, here's some shots. Uh, we were back in another vehicle and these trucks had to turn around because this fire was getting too close. And, uh, and it was just, these are both tenders from uh, Grand Lake and they had to turn around. Um, and this was, if 
know this time's not right, but this was actually shot around 5.30. So in October, 5.30, it's still light out. And this is the way the light was at that particular time. It was just something apocalyptic. It was just, um, it's scary. It's, um, you look at this and you wonder, you know, how anything could survive. You know, I've got pictures of wildlife and you're wondering, you know, how anything could get away from this. But uh, this just, this fire moved so fast and so violent that, uh, you know, you, you know, you can see from this shot, you know, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near that. Um, and I was shooting this, I think, with uh, 70 to 200. And I was just across a little peninsula on the lake when it burned right out into the lake. Um, so then we'll jump back into some of the after stuff. This is some of the uh, firefighters at the scene of where the Heidmans had uh, perished in their um, house. Um, if any of you watch the stories or any of the newscasts, they were the couple, elderly couple that was in Side their home and they didn't want people risking their lives to get back in to save them and he had built a bunker that he thought was, was would stand the fire and it didn't um i was actually down in the bunker when they um just after they retrieved their the remains and um it it's it's stuff i don't ever want to see again but um you know it it, it's very sad to see stuff like this, to see somebody's home and life and uh, all their possessions and, and to see, you know, a lot of these people knew them. Um, they were very well known in the community, but to go back in and cover this story from this kind of view, this, this photo was very well um, viewed. It, I look at this as kind of like, you know, them raising the flag. This flag was raised um, at the scene of where they died. They were the two that perished in the fire and um, being in the right place at the right time and getting this picture was, you know, it, it tells a story. Um, and um, Grand County is gonna use this for some stuff. But walking around, um, um, notice the heart right there in the lake. I found that very interesting. Looking at every detail that you can when you're shooting is, is you know, it, you, you got to look around and be very observant of everything because I thought that was really unique that that heart was there um, and covering things like this is where the fire came through the hottest and you can see it's like the surface of the moon back there I and mean, it just basically melted that ATV to nothing I mean that's all basically all the metal on it aluminum and, and, and stuff that was just melted um, I'll just jump through a couple more of these this was the, the road that you know, where the fire was crossing, um, some of the burn areas. I like to play around. This was shot in color, but the black and white really gives it a kind of a cool effect. Um, being back in at the, the fires um, with gasoline still burning and um, the smell of propane and all this fumes in the air um, covering stuff, you know, you can see visually looking at uh, where somebody obviously tried to, was trying to hook up a hose to, you know, to possibly save their house the last minute and, uh, you know, finally had to leave. And then you see things like this, you're wondering why this house didn't burn and everybody else did. Um, to this day, I don't know why. <laughs> it's just a, a matter of, you know, uh, how the fire burned through and, and what they were able to save. Um, shooting and a lot of times especially on this fire i was up for four days i didn't sleep except for little cat naps that i could when i could um shooting i didn't stop once um i mean i was shooting at night when the fire was coming through i was shooting during the day um i i would sleep when we were driving around and i got a few minutes to to grab a quick cat nap um but you know we're shooting in the middle of the night when the fire is lays down and it makes these beautiful images um, of the wind blowing and the stars and, and kind of gets a different perspective of, you know, the beauty of the fire and the destruction. Um, finding little things like this, going back in with homeowners, um, being up front with, uh, you know, seeing a lot of the devastation. You know, that's one of the trees that you can see over the valley where the fire came through. And right now they're, they're, they're saying that this is one of Colorado's hottest and fastest burning fires in the history of Colorado. Um, not to mention, I think it's between that one and the Cameron Peak fire is one of the biggest fires. But um, um, 
not only covering the fire, but trying to keep a, you know, an eye out for pictures like this. You ask yourself, you know, how could this even be possible? It burnt the dome around the, the light bulb, but the light bulb is still perfectly intact. So um, just seeing little things like that, um, watching out for the wildlife um, and getting shots of like this one lone moose, you know, walking through some of the, right after the fire had come through, we were on the back side of it. And as we drove down the road, there were so many trees and snags and, and things like that. In some places it was impossible. You had to get out and move uh, tree limbs that were right in front of your car in order to even get, um, get through. So, but we found this one moose just kind of wandering along in the, in the, in the burnt out areas. Um, you know, that's kind of the sky during the middle of the day. Um, and please, if anybody has questions, feel free to ask, but, you know, even covering stuff at dusk and, and trying to tell a complete story of, you know, here's an owl. And I, I like this shot because it shows a, a tree that has made it a tree that's halfway burned and then a stump that was, that was completely burned. And then the owl is still, you know, um, you know, getting, getting his food and, managed to get this one late at night, I think with the two to 500 and uh, just a fluke. I even got this shot because it was just a, a brief, quick second that I saw it and I managed to get it actually in focus and get it shot. Um, you know, going back through some of the devastation, I think there's so much beauty in fire and, and covering these up close like this is just, you, you see things that, that just, blow your mind. I mean, it's, it, you can't, I mean, look at all this. This was a, what I was told by one of the owners up there that this was a lush green forest before this happened. If I, if I wished I had before pictures of this, but um, you know, it was a lush green forest. So it, um, this is what I was talking about, the snow and the um, stuff coming through, just kind of visually trying to keep, you know, uh, um, an eye on all the different aspects of it, um, you know, from uh, the, the um, air fights to the shooting through the sun, um, trying to get like the blue sky and things like that. It's even after the fire, initial fire came through, it's, it's really dangerous walking around here. I stepped into some areas where um, my leg dropped down into some areas that had been burning underground. It had burned out the, the, peat moss and everything that was underneath it and I actually stepped down into something that went up to my knee and, and it was still hot underneath there so that's one of the reasons we wear a lot of protective gear because I didn't expect that it just kind of happened this is one of the owners looking through some of her stuff I try not to go too quickly through these um, but showing the green and the burnt forest in the background um, just keeping an eye out for things like this. I thought this was interesting. The bottom of it was completely burned, but the fire restriction sign was still, it looked like it hadn't even been touched. So uh, it was probably made out of metal and whatever that was in the foreground was, or in the bottom was made out of wood. And then trying to get some wildlife shots and stuff like that. Um, I'm gonna see if I can play a video here. Um, this is from, these are from other fires, but let me, let me go back here and I'll try to find this video. Let's see where I put it here. Uh, I think this is it right here. And I will play this if it'll let me. Actually, let me go into here. Take this off. Let's see where I put it. Okay. So this is a this is a small video that I did um, on the fire. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So I'll let this run. It's only two minutes long, so I'm trying to do a lot of the um, the stills. I I did try to do some video at the same time because some, you know trying to show it all in
And this was all shot on my D810 when I wasn't shooting stills. This is one of the houses we went into the basement and went through. I was with a homeowner when they were going through all the stuff, trying to find um, anything that they can remember from their past, but most of the stuff was completely gone. And if anybody has ever been to the backside of uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, this was uh, near the Grand Lake area in the Sun Valley. So this is Rocky Mountain National Park. So that's um, a small video that I did um, from, from the fires um, I just put together. I'm working with uh, another, um, another crew, video crew, and we're, we're trying to, we're doing a documentary that we're hoping to get on Netflix sometime soon because of the, the destructiveness of this fire. Um, and um, let me Stop sharing the screen here. So um, if anybody's got any questions, um, I'd love to answer them. Um, I mean, I can, I can talk about the fire some more, but um, basically from the time I got to this fire in Grand Lake, you know, why everybody's leaving the fire and trying to get out, you know, I'm the, I'm the guy that's trying to get in and get embedded with one of the crews to go back into some of the most dangerous areas to get these shots. This is one of the things that I've, I've pride myself on for, for getting in there, getting the shots and doing it safely. Um, you know, like I said, you know, this is something, you know, that, you know, when you're trained and you have the right gear and you, you get in there, um, you know, you're more likely to, you know, be able to be embedded with one of the crews if you show them the right paperwork and you've done the right training and things like that, that's what's got me these shots. Um, you know, normally I wouldn't be, they wouldn't allow anybody just in there like that, but um, getting to know a lot of the crews. And when I was younger, I used to, um, I used to go to a lot of house fires and structure fires. And I would, I would take pictures of the firefighters there um, putting out the fires and, and, um, this is back in the old print days. I get the film developed and I'd make prints and I would take the prints to the firehouse and I'd give them to the firefighters and, and I developed a really good relationship with them. So over the years, um, you know, they got to know me. They knew that I was trained. They knew that I've done the different types of fire training and it allowed me to, to bond with them in order for me to get in. So, um, you know, 
two, three years down the road, when there was a big fire, they would let me pass the lines and I would be able to get in and shoot the fires and get the better angles and things like that, which really, you know, was, was helpful. It's, you know, as with anything, um, you all being photographers, I don't know what everybody does, but, you know, having this knowledge and this information and, and making these, you know, these connections with people is the really important thing. Um, you know, it, it, I like to say, you know, a lot of my job is, you know, 80% um, communication and talking with people and making these connections and the other 20% is shooting. Um, because without that, without those connections and those people that you know and the right gear and stuff, a lot of times people, you know, they'll just shut you down and you won't get these shots. So it's really taken a lot over the years to, to understand that it's, it's not all about the picture, it's about telling the story and making those connections. So, um, but um, getting back to that day, you know, getting into that fire early and uh, knowing my escape routes, um, there was some very particular area, you know, precarious areas that I got into that, you know, um, I was, you know, fearful of my life, but I knew that I had an escape route. I knew that I could get out. I knew I had good communications. I knew where the winds were coming from. I knew where the fire was going. A lot of times fires can change if you're up on a hillside and you're shooting and the winds will change directions. The next thing you know, you're, you're uphill from a fire, which is a very bad place to be. Um, that's what happened to the, the people that perished in the um, fire up by Colorado Springs. They, their communications were bad and they ended up on the hill. The fire changed directions and they couldn't get people. They, did, they didn't have a right escape route and they were able to deploy their shelters, but they were overcome by fumes and they perished in the fire. Um, you know, I have fire shelter but that's a last result that I wanna to have to deploy a fire shelter because it's not a 100% that you'll uh, survive through, especially a fire of this magnitude um, when it comes through. Um, you know, people, I've, I've talked to a couple of residents up there that said that when they were driving out of this fire, there were logs falling, trees falling on their cars. And one girl that I know up there her husband is a firefighter um, and she basically had to gun her car, her Jeep and go up over a nether um, a tree stump that had fallen and went into her radiator just to get out of the fire. It was so scary for her and I can't imagine going through that. Um, even the situations that I was in, you know, I had less than very low visibility. You couldn't breathe. Um, your eyes watered and burned so much that it was at some points I was just holding the camera up like this and taking pictures and just hoping to get what I can. Um, I think within those two days of shooting, I probably went through at least 10 64 gigabyte chips. And I have, I like to shoot in raw um, and I get about close to, I think about 700 images per chip in that with that camera. And um, I mean, going through the images, so there are some images that I don't even remember shooting because I was just kind of shooting on the run, um, just whatever I can. Um, let's see, I'll go back, well. Tom, I have a question. Yeah. Um, knowing your knowledge of fires and things and what we've been through this year in Colorado, what do you have any kind of prediction of are we out of the woods or we have still that was a pun no pun intended but <laughs> <laughs> are we going to have a lot more of these the way the patterns have been ch changing unfortunately yeah i'm a native of colorado and i've been since i was old enough to drive i've been chasing storms or chasing fires one of the two and this last year was probably one of the most bizarre years I've ever seen. Um, I actually went out, I, I did very little storm chasing. We had very little storms last year in 2020. And with the way things that are happening this year, um, I'm not a meteorologist, but I can tell you that um, just looking at some of the, the dew points that we had, the other day I was looking at one of the fire uh, weather sites and, um, and looking at some of the humidity levels and we were at 14% humidity. 
And I remember during Buffalo Creek, we were at 4% humidity and that fire moved as fast as a fire can move. Um, I covered the, um, the Heyman fire from a helicopter. I covered it on the ground. I was on that fire shooting for Time Magazine and a couple of other publications for almost two weeks straight. I mean, it was, I, everything I owned smelled like smoke. I, <laughs> my fire gear, I could, it, it, the cameras, everything. And I know during those times, the, the humidity levels were so low. And if we don't get some snow soon, it, it is, I mean, unfortunately, we're gonna have another year of this. Um, I've even talked to people up in Rocky Mountain National Park. I've talked to people, I'm in good communication with people that are rebuilding up there. And they said that there's still stuff smoldering places because it's, it's actually burning underground now. Um, two weeks, um, I was up around Thanksgiving. This fire was came through in the end of October. And here it is when it was Thanksgiving, I was up there shooting, walking around, and I still saw flames at the bottoms of trees. And um, it, it, it's unbelievable that, that this would still be burning this far out because the snow came down, but the trees were still smoldering and little hot spots would pick up. Now, if this fire is still burning underground, all it's going to take is um, when things start drying out, if we don't get the moisture that we need, um, it's going to flare back up and it's going to take the right wind and it's going to get into some areas where it hasn't burned and it could start back up very easily. Now, I know that I'm going to be back up there covering this story because um, every fire I've covered in Colorado, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a heat of the fire, there's the... Uh, the, you know, rebuilding, and then unfortunately comes the floods. There is nothing left on any of these hillsides. Um, even to this day, I, uh, the day or a couple days after this fire had gone through and people started going back up, I saw guys on the hillside throwing straw down because they know what's coming in the spring. If we do get our moisture and it, it, it's gonna wash everything on that hillside down into the rivers, which are gonna clog all the rivers, it's going to uh, cause flash flooding. It's gonna cause the soot to get into the waterways, which is gonna get into a lot of our, uh, their waters and, and, and the, the waters that the wildlife, you know, the fish and things like that. We've already seen fish downstream dying from some of the soot that has gotten into the water. Um, I've had pictures from homeowners up there that have showed me that they, they have dead fish already. And, and this isn't even the start of it. Um, so this story will be going on for probably years to come. Um, I know during the Heyman fire, I covered that even three years after the fire, I was back up there shooting pictures of um, the, the regrowth. And if you go on my website, you'll see a show that I did called The Burning Image, which was a series of fire images that I shot over a period of 20 years, some of the best. And there's a picture in there of three chainsaws that are in the hillside that were completely melted. And to this day, I would love to know the story about that, um, whether there were firefighters that basically had to drop their chainsaws and um, escape, make an escape route. But there are three chainsaws that are completely melted in the hillside. And I found them three years after the fire had burned and it was still, you know, blackened for us. So this is going to be a fire I want to go back up and I want to show the regrowth. I want to show what's happening to the environment afterwards. Um, I love covering stories that I can envelop myself in and, and follow it through different parts of it, the environmental part of it. Um, I went back up and walked around with a CU professor that um, was looking at some of the, the damage, um, maybe like a, a two weeks after the fire and uh, did some pictures of him and, and him walking around. And that's where I ended up with the, when they were going through the, the debris of the Heidman's house where they perished and, and seeing some of that stuff. It, it's one of these things where in my career, I've really had to have a, you know, have a hard shell around me because it's hard to see people going through this and then photographing it. It's, it's not like, you know, you're photographing a, a coyote eating a prairie dog or a bird <laughs> eating a, a mouse or something like that. You're seeing pain and you're seeing these people that have lost everything 
they've owned. People that, one couple that I talked to, they were moving all of their stuff from Aurora to their dream house. And the wind came across one of the lakes up in Sun Valley and the tree fell right between that right on their house and burn it to the ground. And they had moved a lot of their stuff up there. And you kind of have to go at this when you're covering something like this with a very gentle kind of, you don't want to go in there and just start taking pictures of people when they're looking at everything they own is now gone and covering the aftermath. You have to kind of step back, shoot it with a telephoto lens and you work your way into telling a story without being obtrusive and getting in their face like some of the news people do. And I'm very much against that. I, I, I put myself in their place. If, if my whole house burned down, would I want a photographer coming up and sticking his camera in my face when I'm crying or when I'm grieving at the sight of what I've lost? So there's a lot to this, this big picture from the initial writhing covering the the heart of the fire and the height of the fire, and then coming back up and covering each aspect of the fire afterwards. It's it's none of these these things that I've shot, you know, are just a one-time thing and you get the fire and the, the great big flames blowing up and then you leave and that's it. It's it's a very grueling job sometimes. It's 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 being there and and sleeping in really bad conditions and you're not being able to shower for three or four days because now you're in an area where people were evacuated and you can't just go into somebody's house and um, say, hey, you know, <laughs> can I shower in your house? And they're not there. You're going into, you know, unfortunately, I had some really nice people that allowed me to stay in their one of their bed and breakfasts that didn't burn. The fire had burned up to the back of the river and I was able to sleep there for a couple nights. And um, you're away from family, friends, um, the comforts of your own home and stuff like that. It's, it's nice to come home and finally clean up, but then you find yourself back up there a day or two later after you've edited through your images. And that's, that's a whole nother ball when, you, when you're trying to get stuff out to the wire and out to the, the news media and the people to show the devastation of this fire. Um, you, you know, you're constantly on the go. You're, you're going from shooting the fire to, you know, trying to get some sleep to trying to get your, your images and get power and get a Wi-Fi signal and get everything out. So um, hopefully that, that, you know, um, I'm going to look at some of these. Were you able to get back to the yeah. monitor? Like, um, I got all around in different areas. Um, I don't know all the area up there. Um, I knew I was on 125 and I went all the way back through the fire. Um, I was back up into a couple of different areas um, and I shot a lot. I mean, one house starts looking like another house after not too long, everything's burnt and the ground's just basically scorched down to nothing. So it's, um, it, it's hard to tell where even road signs are. I had people messaging me and saying, you know, we heard you're up at the fire and you're with whatever. Can you tell me if my house is still there? Well, first of all, I didn't see your house before it was. And <laughs> most of the houses I saw were burnt to the ground. So I couldn't tell where an address was and, you know, anything like that. But um, I'll stop talking. I Hopefully I didn't talk your guys' ear off and I gave you guys some yeah. little bit of insight on what I've experienced and, and some of the things, you know, um, you know, the long lasting effects of all the fire smoke that I've breathed and all the places I've been, I'm just, hopefully it doesn't tell me to do this again. And hopefully we don't have a fire season like we did in 2020, but unfortunately, um, um, okay. And somebody just asked about the drone photography. Um, so, um, I just have, um, I've got FAA certified for to be, um, I had to go through all the pilot training for drone um, and be able to fly. I had to get permission to be able to fly up around some of these fires out. And obviously I'm not one of these yahoos that flies a drone around a, an active fire when it's burning. First of all, the, the radiant heat coming off of this thing would have would have melted it or blown it into the fire. There's no way I could fly a drone when that was happening, but I did was able to fly it afterwards and um, 
fly it over some of the burn areas. And, uh, but that was well after air ops had completed. Um, you, you've got, really got to be cautious about it. I fly with a DGI Mavic 2 and it's, it's a small drone, but it did a great job. It, you can shoot in ROM modes on it. Um, I was able to fly it above some things. One of the shots that I really wished I could have got and I didn't um, was a picture of like an elk or a, a moose walking through from a drone angle but um, I didn't see any wildlife around. During the heat of the fire, I saw a lot of wildlife leaving the fire, trying to seek refuge. But at that point, you can't fly drones because it's, it's not safe because you've got air ops going around and uh, you can't take a chance that you, know, you would be causing an aircraft crash because you're trying to get a shot. So most everything there was shot from the ground level. Hey, Tom, Tom, you said that, you know, uh, you described it as being embedded with the crew and just wondering if you could, you know, give us some insight into what that was like, you know, day to day. And did you, did you have much control over where you went or were you just sort of at the mercy of wherever they were going is where you had to go? Um, basically, I, I was, I was allowed to drive into a certain area and I shot for a little while there, but then at some point, um, I got I got on with one of the crews there and, and explained to them and showed them my credentials. I showed them that I've I've successfully passed the, the fire training, and then I rode with them. A lot of them were allowed to go in and do different stuff to try to save different houses and things like that. Um, I I was you know some of the stuff that I shot was you know crews um, working in different areas, but. Um, I was with a guy that, uh, um, you know, he was with the Grand County Fire Department. We were shooting, he was driving around just kind of spotting things. So I was able to shoot from different areas. We watched the fire. We had to be in safe areas. Uh, we, you know, in no way, shape or form were we ever going to be in an area where we get surrounded by fire and we get cut off and we put ourselves in a situation where now we needed to be rescued. And then what that does is that takes firefighters away from the, the initial fire to try to rescue somebody that you know, put themselves in danger. That's why I try to be with the right people, be in the right area, know my escape path. One of the things we learned in our fire training is to always be in the black. Um, that's your safe area. If, if you're ever in a situation where you know, there's a fire, you get into an area where there's no fuels um, and you, you, know, you stay in the black areas because you know, the fire can't burn what it's already burned. Um, but uh, you don't want to be in a, a gully and you don't want to be, you know, because of this fire, the winds were so erratic that day, the winds blew nonstop and blew that fire. What I thought was would never happen. It blew it up into Rocky Mountain National Park and up onto when they were evacuating Estes Park. I was like, how is this fire going to make it over uh, Rocky Mountain National Park over the peaks and down into Estes Park? And then I realize now from looking back at some of the weather reports on how fast this fire was moving, this was not a fire that you wanted to be in front of in any way, shape or form. It was something they could not, they were having trouble fighting it from the air. They would not put crews in front of this fire because it was burning so hot, so erratic. So it was kind of like get people out of the way, stay back and watch the fire. So we were at a point where we were back on, um, road 34 going into Grand Lake watching this fire jump across and fortunately it didn't burn into the town which I was down into the town when it was like that and, and people were talking about how Grand Lake was burning and it it wasn't <laughs> you know it burned around it went to the north side of Grand Lake and up through Rocky Mountain National Park and they were able to save you know the town some of the houses burned and I was surprised by a lot of houses were still standing it was just a matter of where the trees had fallen. Um, two houses were completely burnt to the ground. And then there was a house right next to it that trees were all around it, but it didn't burn. So it's, it's, I like to chalk it up to like, if you've ever seen tornado damage, that a tornado would come and take one house and the next house was completely standing and nothing left. Or, you know, I my son-in-law is on the Grand County Fire Board and they have a cabin that his family has had for 125 years that's right on the lake, just as you come into, into town. And they had some really, really tough nights worrying 
uh, until the fire uh, uh, started out towards Rocky Mountain National Park. They were afraid that they were on the other end, you know, as you come into Grand Lake and yeah. uh, they, uh, they're they okay. But my son-in-law uh, is on the fire board and everything you've said about the prospects for this year is exactly how the fire board is seeing things. Yeah. And, and unfortunately it's, it's a situation of we're, we're, we're not, anywhere remotely out of the woods if if we don't get and I, I don't know how many of you here are from Colorado but Colorado has changed um, we used to see these snowstorms in October and November and December and January and February and I don't think we saw much of a little spit on our you know I know the mountains are getting some snow which is good but we need some snow down here too. Um, I'm just hoping that our, our March, our February, March, and April will get those wet, wet snows. But the drawback to those snows from what I've learned in fire training is that if these snows come through and they dump and they then things dry out, it makes it actually worse in the long run. We need storm after storm after storm to really saturate the ground and to get some of this green growing up to where we don't have all these dried out you know, timbers. I mean, if anybody's walked through a field down here lately, it's, you know, it's crunchy crunch and it's, you know, fires can break out. We've had fires just the other day too, one in Cherry Creek and one in up near Lakewood. And um, who knows, somebody throwing a cigarette out, somebody dropping something, but it's so tender out there. And um, I'm afraid this is not going to be the end of this, this fire season. I, I, I don't even know if we had an end to this fire season and we're going into the next one because I know there's still things burning, you know, around. Um, so hopefully, you know, it'll it'll die down and, you know, I won't have to cover this stuff. But as it keeps going, each fire is new and each fire starts up something new. Um, I'll just jump back. We When I was on, when I was sent to the East Troublesome Fire, I was on the Calwood Fire and that blew up within a few minutes, it looked like a, a mushroom cloud over Boulder. And I was driving up to the Cameron Peak fire and it happened right in front of me. And before you knew it, that fire was coming down into million dollar homes above the, the north side of Boulder on the way to Lyons and it was just burning them. And there was nothing they could do. It just, it moved so fast and so rapidly. It's, it's scary, it is beyond, scary to see this stuff happen. I, I mean, within probably an hour, I watched that fire jump three ridges and, um, and burn down into some houses. And then when the smoke cleared enough, I could see there were houses burning. You can always tell because the black smoke starts pillowing out and you know, there's either a tree on fire or a house on fire. And, uh, you know, you, you, at that point, a lot of the firefighters just, they just get out of the way because unless they have aerial ops that can come in and, and spot and start laying down slurry, um, there's not a lot they can do with wind whip fires like that. It's just a, a sit back and wait. And I, I feel so bad for a lot of the residents because they, they want to know why firefighters aren't on the ground doing anything, but it's not safe for them to be there doing that. So, Thomas? Yeah. Um, you know, there's so much beetle kill in our trees and our forests. Yeah. Uh, what do the what do the fire guys think about that? Because that's just ready to go up. Yeah. The um, going back maybe five years, I've did some pictures on the backside of Rocky Mountain National Park, and I think um, shooting. I think there's a photo on my site under the burning image that shows it, it's so much yellow, brown, and red trees that. I mean, there's very few green trees left. And that's one of the things that we're working on in this um, documentary that we want to touch base on is why the Forest Service is not letting people in to cut this beetle kill and manage the forests a little better. Because that is what I personally, I believe that if we had the right kind of forest management to get people in, or to, I, and I know it's a logistic nightmare to try to manage a forest of a hillside like that with beetle kill and do it safely. They can't just let any Joe off the street and with a chainsaw to start cutting down trees because it's a it's a hazard and you know people are going to get killed that way. 
And then to come in with helicopters and to take all this out is, is a logistics nightmare. But there is so much beetle kill back there. And that was one of the things that I talked to one of the residents about um, is the, um, the amount of beetle kill that was um, right at the base of the Sun Valley area. And that's why that fire burned so hot through there because the whole hillside was covered in beetle kill. And a lot of people there told me that it was not a question of if it was gonna happen is when. Um, you know, it was, it was going to happen. It just, it, the right stuff was in place that night for that fire to come through and, you know, to completely melt things like you saw in that ATV and just burn stuff. Um, I mean, the house that I was in, I was down in the ashes taking pictures of them looking for some of the stuff. Um, Wayne Heidman, who's his dad had perished. He was a Denver firefighter. He was the, the, the dad of the, the, the couple that was killed. Anyway, their son was looking through the ashes and they had a big safe that was on a the second level and the whole house just burned and the safe went down, broke open and the guns that were in the safe were completely incinerated. And he had $15,000 guns in there. And um, I mean, just the, the, the heat and of how this thing burned was just, it's, you can't wrap your head around it. It was just like, there was no way, if you were in that fire, the, the heat, what I was told and what I've learned from the firefighters is that Wayne and uh, Marilyn Heidman who perished in that fire, um, they didn't die because of the fire, they died because the oxygen was being sucked out of the house um, and they died from asphyxiation before the fire ever made it there because this fire breathes, sucks all the oxygen into the fire because it was burning so hot that they had no air and they died from that. And then the fire came through and burned, burned them, but um, it, there's no oxygen in there. And I can be attest that because when I was shooting in some of the places there, it's hard to breathe just from the smoke, but when the when the when the fire is burning so hot, it sucks all that oxygen into the fire, and it it's it's hell. It's literally you're walking around and you feel like you're on the surface of the hell, or on Mars or some place. It it is the most eeriest thing, as you can see from some of the photos. You know, you just hear the crackling and and uh, the trees falling down in the background. I remember shooting pictures of that. Um, elk or that moose walking through the debris and I could hear things cracking in the background and falling and you know there were trees that just finally gave up and <laughs> came down so um, any other questions anybody <laughs> this is um you know, I thought this was incredible um you know everything you, you talked about in in the setup and then going through providing us a uh, you know a perspective that obviously not many people get to see maybe don't want to see you know it was a a painfully beautiful presentation if that is a a, a right a good way to express it um, I yeah. you know, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, talking to us about your experiences not only with this fire but many of the others and you know we could go on and on I think about you know as, as uh you know Leander mentioned you know the beetle kill there's so much fuel load up there the fire suppression techniques over decades and decades you know that's do they get to the point where it's like okay just try to save as many people as you can and you gotta let the forest burn itself out and regenerate to where a forest should be yeah uh, it, it was a very good presentation I thank you very much Thomas for coming on yeah, and um, just to touch base on that, it's what I've been told from firefighters, it's um, before we built into the forests, these forests would burn and then they would eventually, Mother Nature would put these fires out and the forest would rejuvenate. But the problem is, is that we're building in these forests and they're suppressing a lot of these fires. And it's, if you've been to some places where there's literally needles and and pine cones and and when you get a pine cone that gets caught on fire or something and then you get winds like that it's starting fires five miles away and mm -hmm. and and it's it's hard for them to keep up with anything and uh you know i'd see 
debris flying through the air and it's it's mind-boggling and you you see what what's happening in this you know that it's going to keep happening and there's stories to tell and i hope that we can get um we can get this uh um this video out um i would like to share the video with you but um i can't right now because it is a um it is just a, a sneak reel and we're still working on it but uh Hopefully this will be something that you'll see on the news to come. And uh, um, it's just gonna be called Troublesome. I'm working with two Grand Lake uh, residents who are filmmakers who are doing this. And we're trying to tell this story in a perspective of the whole thing. Cause like I was telling you, it's not just about the fire, it's about the, the people and the, the water and the, the growth and the forest and the management. There's so many different parts to this story, so. Yeah. Will the National Park Service, because you're working on a documentary, will the National Park Service give you a one-time waiver to fly your drone over the park, since you're not supposed to fly drones over national parks? Um, yeah, basically, a couple of times that I flew my drone, um, I just, I took it up because I knew from what, what I talked to the firefighters that there was no aerial stuff going on, and I flew it around some of the areas on the outskirts of the park. Some of the areas I was in, I flew over the park, but um, I didn't. Um, I didn't always gain permits to do this. You know, I I took it up to a certain altitude and made sure it was okay. But we're hoping we've we've flown it over a couple of times. Um, you know, we want to be respectful of people. We you know, but we want to tell a story too. And um, there's just a lot of red tape to go through when it comes through drone stuff. Yeah, and, um, I know the FAA is 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 relaxing some of it but um and with the you know even with um the drone that i fly i know when i fly it for a commercial use and um i'm able to fly it now it's telling me that there are aircraft in the area and i guess the aircraft is going to start knowing where i'm at so the safety is definitely going to be there and i think in the future you know you've heard about these stories where people are flying drones over fires and they have to shut down all all their aerial ops eventually they're going to put up a thing where your drone is not going to be able to fly even take off and there's been some areas where i've had to go on and get written permission to be able to fly a drone um because my drone wouldn't even take off the ground because it's in a restricted area so um but uh yeah well i'm i'm, I'm glad you guys had me on here i'm very honored to be um in front of all you guys talking about this this is very passionate to me and you know, hopefully uh, I can still make some images and keep making images of these fires and telling the story. And that's the main thing I want to get out there is, you know, to talk about, you know, what these things are doing, because the news talks a lot about it, but an initial state of what happens, you know, goes away. It's like with anything, you get a big news story. And then two weeks later, nobody, I even have people say, well, what was the troublesome fire? <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's like, well, it's still very relevant in my mind, and we're trying to keep these things alive to be able to, to tell people, you know, next year, be careful, you know, um, make that space around your house so your house can survive. And the firefighters don't have to worry about your house. I saw a lot of firefighters. Unfortunately, they look at a house and they have to sum it up. If it's a house that they can keep and they can get in and save, they will. But if you've got trees growing up through your deck that are dead, they're not going to be able to save your house. Um, it's, you know, they, they can't put all their efforts into cutting down trees in a house. It's called having defensible space. So um, anyway, that's going off onto the fire part of it. But uh, um, hopefully you can all, uh, <laughs> you're not living in a situation like that. So. Well, a lot of great comments. Um, oh, Dave, I'm sorry. Were you going to ask a question? I thought I saw someone chiming in. Oh, okay, my bad. Um, yeah, there are some great comments about your uh, presentation, Thomas. You know, so um, I think everyone really enjoyed it. Uh, once again, thank you very much. And, and maybe after you've uh, done some follow-up, you know, later in the year or 2022, we can have you back to kind of do the the, the second half of the story, yeah. as you said. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, I'm going to keep telling this story because it's it's got a lot of different components of it for sure. Okay, well, thank you very much. And um, we'll let you get on with your evening and you. we'll wrap up the meeting for everyone. And I'm glad nice. everyone joined in. Thanks a lot, Tom.
Thank you. Thank for you very much, Thomas. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Program. All right. Take care. Thanks. You too. Thanks very much.